and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Let's bow our hearts down in a word of prayer. God and Father, again we do thank you for Jesus Christ and the opportunity we have of looking at your word and studying it this morning as we do so now. We pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ and would edify the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to begin a series of studies this morning, a four-week series. And um, we're going to look at the times, when, well actually, uh, based on what happened at Glasgow, it's turned into at least a five-week series maybe eight if we split them all into two um, because I only got halfway through so you know, oh well that's the way it goes preachers you know they never run out of stuff to say so uh, we were at, at the Great Commission School um, homecoming banquet last night and three of the alumni spoke that's why Madeline's home she spoke last night and um, no, so I'm home to see everyone. oh 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 okay uh, well, well would you have been here if you weren't speaking last night <laughs> yeah I'm sure you would have um, so uh, so one of the guys, one of the kids that spoke is is going to be a preacher, and um, the, each kid had five minutes. And I said to Madeline, "There's no way. There's no way. If this if this guy's going to be a preacher, there's no way he's." Gonna, and he didn't. He was like ten minutes. So he was the longest of any of them. So um, so anyhow, it's it's a occupational hazard, I guess. So we're going to however many weeks it takes. I'll just put it that way. Look at Paul's faithful sayings. There are four times in Paul's epistles when he says this is a faithful saying. And we know what a saying is. A saying is something that, you know, it's, 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 um, it's general knowledge and general information and we repeat it a lot. It's generally accepted to be true. Uh, so we repeat it a lot and it becomes a saying. Um, like, you know, read at night, sailor's delight. Read in the morning, sailor's warning. A stitch in time saves nine. Um, you know, all, sayings like that that we hear growing up as a kid and it just becomes... Um, the thing about these sayings in scripture, and, and generally sayings become sayings because they're generally true. Not necessarily true every single time, but they're generally true. Um, these sayings in Paul's epistles, are all, they are faithful. In addition to being a saying that is something that should be repeated again and again, they are faithful sayings. You can trust them. You can have faith in them. They are always true because sometimes sayings that we have can, can be contradictory. For instance, we have the saying, um, uh, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. When you're away from someone, you, you miss them and you want them more. Then we have the other saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play. And that means, you know, when, when somebody's away, then it's time to party. So, so sometimes sayings can be contradictory because sometimes one is true and sometimes the other is true. These sayings in Paul's epistles are, are faithful. That is, they can always be trusted on, they can always be counted on, they're worthy of being repeated. Uh, because of that, because they're true, and they're things that should be often repeated. Um, as, as we look at them, the saints are nothing, as we look at each one, you'll see that it's not, it's not some uh, amazing, like the one we're looking at today. Um, uh, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Well, you know, that is not, for, for most of the people in this room, that is not a, a, an earth shattering, hopefully for all the people in this room, that's not an earth shattering, never heard before truth. Um, it's something that we know to be true, it's something that we understand, it's something that we trust, yet it is something that Paul says needs to be repeated. It is a faithful saying. This should become, and maybe of all the faithful sayings we're going to look at, this is the one, if I'd said this morning, started off by saying, um, tell me uh, where Paul talks about a faithful saying. This is probably the one most of you would come up with. So, you know, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And it's got that neat little word in it. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. You know, that's a word you don't use like every day, you know, in, at work, you know. Well, I think that should be acceptation. Yeah, well, you don't say that much, but it's, I think it's kind of a neat word. It's worthy of all acceptation, which we would say today acceptance, but acceptation is a more old English way to say it. And um, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and then Paul says, of whom I am chief. Now, we're going today, if you read on down through the passage, verse 16, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first, uh, that, in me, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe to him on life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 
So as you read the next couple of verses after that and look at some of the context around that saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, one of the things that Paul does, and this is, is really what we're going to focus on today uh, and, and probably exclusively today because we're, we're not going to get to the second part, um, he, he makes sure we understand. He says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, but then as he concludes this little, little section in verse 17, under the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He makes sure we understand who is Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Who is this Christ Jesus? What does it mean that he came into the world to save sinners? And as part of that, he defines who Christ is. Um, under the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. So we want to take a morning, a little bit, little time this morning, and look at at that, that statement, the only wise God, the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, and understand the importance. You know, and, and again, that's a statement that we read it and we say, we kind of read over it and say, well, yeah, we, yeah, we, all, yeah, we all believe that. But you understand that most of the world does not believe that. The Eastern religions, which are polytheistic, certainly don't believe that, that, that Jesus Christ is the only wise God. Islam certainly doesn't believe that because they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God at all. So when you look at the percentage of the world and the proportion of the world that believes that, what we would think to be a very simple statement, that Christ is the only wise God, we're in a minority. We as believers are in a minority um, of the world population that believe that. So even though we might think, yeah, no big deal, Jesus Christ is God, it is a big deal. <laughs> it's a very big deal. It should be a big deal to us, even though we know it uh, and we've heard it you know, most of our lives, most of us. But it, it is a very big deal to, the, to most of the world who doesn't even know it, some of whom have never even heard that truth, never even heard that name, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is a big deal, uh, and, and it is something that we need to be sure we understand. Um, that phrase, the only wise God, if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and again, nothing we talk about this morning I think is going to be earth-shattering for most of you, but, but it is a saying. A saying is something that we need to repeat. It's something, a saying becomes a saying because people repeat it. And as I said, it's generally found to be true. In this case, it's always found to be true because it's a faithful saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says this in verse 4, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, excuse me, and we by him. There is but one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about that that title, Lord Jesus Christ, and why it's important. But Paul, there, there are God's many and Lord's many, but then if you compare that to 1 Timothy chapter 1, there is only the only wise God. There is only one God that is wise. His, he, ex he exceeds and excels over all other gods in wisdom. He exceeds and he excels over all other gods in power. He exceeds and he excels all, all, all other gods. Um, he, he is a God that is the only wise God, and there is only one of them. Um, if you turn over to Romans chapter 9, Paul talks about... Uh, Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 9 and, and his understanding of him. And you know, many people, they, 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 it's important to understand what Paul thought of Christ. And many people will use the argument to say, well, you know, Jesus Christ never claimed to be God in his earthly ministry. But it, we know and understand, and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning, that certainly he did. Uh, and certainly, and we will look at this some this morning, the things he did demonstrated who he was, demonstrated that he was God. You know, when he said, before Abraham was, I am. We know who I, you know, you go back to the book of, of Exodus, you know, uh, Moses said, who should I say sent me? 
You say, I am, I am that I am. You tell them, I am sent you. So when they said, when he said, I am, before Abraham was, I am, they understood what he, that's why they took up stones to stone him when he said that. He, he definitely understood who he was claiming to be. Moreover, they understood who he was claiming to be. Those Jews understood who he was claiming to be, and that's why they hated him for it. So you, you are not you, this, this, servant, this meek, lowly, coming on the colt, the foal of an ass, you cannot be our king. That is just, that's not going to happen. Well, um, yes, he came in his humility so that he could come in glory, but they rejected him because of that, because you can't be the king. You can't be the Messiah. You can't be Jehovah that did so many things in the Old Testament, and now here you are coming meek and humble, and Jesus of Nazareth. And Nazareth, if you if you look study it, it's a place of rejection. You know, it's like saying, you know, Jesus of Bellwood or something like that. It's like, wow, who would want to who would want to come from there? So um, it's 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 just it's like he's from the wrong side of the track. So that's a better way to say it than it doesn't pick on George and Pam uh, and Stephen. So it's, he's from the wrong side of the tracks, and 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 it was a name of derision. So we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But look at Romans chapter nine verse four, who are Israelites. To whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Paul understood who Christ was. If you go to Colossians chapter 1. Um, he makes this statement, and we're going to see these statements that Paul makes in Colossians chapter 1 are echoed by the circumcision writers in the book of Hebrews and in the book of John. Um, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 15, and this is all speaking of Christ. If you look at verse 14, in whom, and, and, and the whom there is Christ, in whom uh, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, he's before all things, and by him all things consist. Um, he is before all things, he is the creator of all things, by him all things consist, he's the firstborn of every creature, he is the image of the invisible God. And if you look over to chapter 2, he expands on that a little bit in verse 8 of chapter 2 in Colossians. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ, all the fullness, everything that God is, is in Christ, only in a bodily form so we can see it. Um, we look back in, in that passage, um, uh, he is the, the image of the invisible God. So the God that we can't see is made visible to us in the person of Christ, or in his earthly ministry he was made visible, uh, the, the parts of what God is. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the, everything that God is, all the characters that he has, all the, the, the qualities that he had is seen in bodily form in Christ. If you go back to the book of John, John says very much similar things uh, in connection with the nation Israel and his ministry to Israel. And, and John is the, the gospel writer that's presenting Jesus Christ as God. Um, Matthew presents him as the coming king. Matthew's focus is on the kingdom of heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, uh, Mark presents him as a servant, a servant that's going to come and serve his people and wash their feet and, and go to the cross and die on their behalf. Luke presents him as the son of man. Luke the physician focused on the physical part of Jesus Christ and he presents him as a man. John comes along and presents him as God. And that's why there are four gospels. If you go to the Old Testament, uh, and we've done this in the past, you'll find that, that Jesus Jesus Christ is called the branch. He's the branch that comes up out of the root of David. And there is a branch that is the king, there's a branch that is a servant, there's a branch that is a man, and there's a branch that is God. And you can find all four of those in the Old Testament. So Israel was looking for someone that was a king, a servant, man, and God. That's the branch that's going to come up out of David. So when he comes on the scene, these four gospel writers present him that way to demonstrate he is the one. He is the one that was presented in the Old Testament. He is the branch that is the king, a man, 
I'm a servant, a man, and God. John says the God part here in chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. That's a pretty clear statement. All things were made by him. That's like what Paul says. Um, all things are, are made by him. By him all things consist. Um, without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. And that verse, we always read the first three about who Jesus Christ was and who he is. And the first three are certainly important, but that verse 4, in him was life. The one thing that separates the one true God, the only wise God from all the other gods, is that he is a God that, that number one, is alive, and that's something that the, the Old Testament prophets and all through the scripture talks about, the living God. You'll see that phrase again and again and again. The living God, the living God, the living God. These other gods, the gods of wood and stone and, and gold and silver, they're, they're dead. They can't, you know, there's, there's verses in the Old Testament that talk about they cannot go on their own. You've got to carry your God from the kitchen to the living room. You know, if you, if you want to worship God in the living room, you've got to carry him there from the kitchen. Well, that's not a very, it's not a very uh, you know, able God. If he can't get from the kitchen to the living room on his own, that means he's not as powerful as us because most of us can do that on our own. So he's a living God, but beyond that, he is a life-giving God. In him was Life. So he's a God that can take a lump of clay and breathe into it, and that lump of clay becomes a what kind of soul? A living soul. So he can, he can, he not only, in him was life, yes, he's alive, but, but in he, he is the source of life. That's what he's talking about. Not just he is alive, but he is the source of life. And he can give physical and spiritual life, and he can breathe physical and spiritual life into a lump of clay or into you as a sinner and make you a saint. Down in verse 14 he says, The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, the word was made flesh. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And what's the fullness of the Godhead? When you boil it down into two things, it's grace and truth. God is a God of grace, God is a God of truth. And in him, in the flesh, in bodily form, we see all that God is. Book of Hebrews chapter 1. The writer of Hebrews, he uh, you know, and some people think it was Paul. I personally don't think it was Paul, but whoever it was, um, he understood who Christ was. It starts off in verse 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So he's, he's writing to Israel. He's writing to who he's writing to is clear, the Hebrews. In time past he sent the prophets to our nation. Hath, verse 2, in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. He is the express image of his person. That's you know, that's, you know, we talk about phrasing things well. Your King James translators, when they, one of the reasons the King James Bible is, is the easiest Bible to memorize and repeat is because of the way it's phrased. Uh, he is the express image of his person. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, another way of saying, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the express image of image something you can see of his person, of the person that God is. And he hath in these last days spoken to us. He spoke to us in the past by prophets. In these last days he has spoken to us by his son. And his son is the express image of his person. Upholding all things by the word of his power. By him all things consist, Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. The writer of Hebrews says... Uh, uh, says that um, the uh, upholding all things by the word of his power. Same, same kind of an idea. Um, the writer of Hebrews talks about what he did. The middle of verse 3. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. 
For under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be unto him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He's higher than the angels, because to which angel has he said, This day have I begotten thee? None of the angels are the only begotten Son of God. Only Christ is begotten and born into this world. Uh, and to which of the angels did he say, I will be to him a father, and he shall be my son? They are, they are not his son, as Jesus Christ is his son. Yet in verse 6, and again, when he bringeth the, uh, in the first begotten into the world, he saith that all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So the angels worship Jesus Christ and the angels are, are min, uh, 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 spirits and ministers uh, a flame of fire. They're ministering spirits. Verse 8, but unto the Son. So that's what he says to the angels, but unto the Son, Jesus Christ, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And I've told you many times, in, in my view and in my understanding of things, you look at that verse, Jehovah God says, Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever. If I ever stand before God and he says, Why in the world did you call Jesus Christ God? I'm going to whip out my little pocket Bible and say, See Hebrews 1.8? Uh, you said it, not me. Under the, thy throne, the Father says to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever. So if you call Jesus Christ God, you're doing nothing less than what the Father did, calling him God. You can't separate, you can't, you can't say that Christ isn't God and who he claimed to be and all of that and not do great damage to the Father because the Father calls him God and the Father uh, ordained his ministry and the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Another way, if you look back to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, and get Zechariah 12 and John 19, and we begin comparing the Old Testament and the New Testament and, and the things that, um, that happen uh, in fulfillment of those Old Testament uh, writings and the Old Testament uh, prophecies. Zechariah chapter 12 and John chapter 19. And you know, it's interesting, people that, that doubt the veracity of Scripture and doubt that the, that the Bible is the Word of God, um, when you begin to, to study the Bible and study the Word of God and you, you understand the ties that are there and, and, and the links that go together and then you try to say could, could man write a book that has all these links and all these fulfillments and all of these things and have them all work out there's a couple here this is just one we'll look at Zechariah chapter 12 verse 1 the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel saith the Lord which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man. So who's so it's Lord in all capital letters, L O R D. So who is it that's speaking here? Jehovah. Jehovah. It's Jehovah God. Saith the Lord, saith Jehovah, that stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. So all of that is about God being the creator. Jehovah is the creator. He stretched forth the heavens. He laid the foundation of the earth. He formed the spirit of man within him. And then he, he goes on, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a couple. So who's I in that verse? Jehovah. Verse 3, In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. Who's the I in that verse? Jehovah. I guess Rhonda's the only one. Well, she's got the headphones on so she can hear, I guess. Um, it's Jehovah. All the way down through it's Jehovah. And then you get to verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So who's the I in the verse? Jehovah, Rhonda is still the only one listening. All right, I will, pour, uh, 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 I will pour upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, or else she's the only one with a big enough mouth for me to hear, maybe. Um, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me. Who's me? Jehovah Christ. Jeho Christ? Jehovah. Is it, if, if it's, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and they'll look on me, Jehovah. then it's the, whoever is I is me, but... It is also Christ, isn't it? And notice how the wording of the verse, how it, it, the pronoun changes. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. So it's me that they pierce, it's Jehovah that they pierce, but when they're looking on it, they're looking on him. They're looking on Christ. And they shall 
Mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and they shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. So that, that wording in Zechariah is, is amazing, and, and this is one scripture that even a Jehovah's Witness Bible didn't mess up and has right. Um, I, 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 Jehovah is doing all this, and they shall look upon me, Jehovah, and they shall mourn for him, Christ. Jehovah and Christ. And when you go back over to John chapter 19 and you see it fulfilled in verse number um, 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out water, or blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth what he saith is true, that ye might believe, for these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So Jehovah God says, you're going to pierce me. But you know who they pierced? They pierced Christ. And why did they pierce him? Well, they came to break his bones, but they didn't break his bones. Why didn't they break his bones? Because he was already dead. Why was he already dead? Because in verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. You see, Christ didn't die the way any normal person dies. That is the way you or I die. You and I don't get to pick the time that we die, and you know, unless suicide aside, we don't get to pick that moment. Jesus Christ, another, another one of the gospel writers said, he dismissed his spirit and he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It, he, he chose, I'm going to dismiss my spirit now. And he dismissed his spirit now when he did because th they're ready to come break his legs. But you know what? There's a, this whole passage is full of um, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now fulfilled, that the scripture or were accomplished, rather, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a, a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled, it with, with, filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Psalm chapter 69, verse 21, said that, he's going to say, that, that they're going to give him, in his thirst, they'll give him vinegar to drink. That's Psalm 69, 21. Remember that? Everybody nod your head up and down. You remember that? Psalm 60, just flip there. Keep your hand in John. Psalm 69, 21. There's a prophecy. And that prophecy says, as soon as I get there, Psalm 69, verse number 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. He hangs there on the cross. We've talked about this many times. He's not out of his mind. He's not, you know, just, just babbling things incoherently. He's exactly fulfilling the prophecy. In my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. He hangs there on that cross. He's ticking off all the prophecies that need to be fulfilled. As he comes close to the end, he says, oh, there's a prophecy. They're going to give me vinegar to drink in my thirst. If I'm hanging up here on the cross and they're all down there looking at me, how do I get somebody to give me a drink? If you want somebody to give you a drink, what do you say? I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. I thirst. And he knows, knowing who they are, if, if he says, I thirst, are they going to give him some nice, cool, refreshing water or a nice glass of sweet tea or something like that? No, they're a bunch of rotten scallywags and they're going to give him vinegar to drink, vinegar uh, mixed with gall. And they brought that to him to drink. And then it's interesting, after that, he, he uh, says, it is finished. Everything I had to do, every prophecy that had to be fulfilled, it's done. And he bowed his head and gives up the ghost. And so that when they came, verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. And we've studied this in the past because if someone is being crucified, the thing that actually ends up killing you is that, that pressure hanging on you. Your lungs fill up with fluid, you can't breathe, and you, you drown in your own bodily fluids. And as long as your legs are not broken, and as long as you can push up with your legs and take the weight off of your arms and your shoulders and your chest, it keeps you alive longer. When your legs are broken, you can no longer take the weight off of your arms and push up and you die quicker. So 
it's, it's the preparation day and these good religious Jews, well, you know, we've got to kill the Messiah quickly because we've got to be spiritual and righteous tomorrow, you know, on the day of the high Sabbath. So that's, and that's typical religion, you know, obviously. We, we look at it and we chuckle and it's ironic, but it, how sad that really is, right? Because, you know, they're killing the Lord of heaven and earth. But we got to get. We can't touch. We can't touch a dead body on the Sabbath, or we'll be unclean. Really, you're, you're afraid that touching a dead body is going to make you unclean, and you're crucifying the Lord of heaven and earth. I think they had it kind of out of whack, didn't they? A little bit. But the point for today is he he knows they're going to come break his legs, so he dismisses his spirit. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And when they come, they don't break his legs. And guess what? There's a prophecy that said says. Uh, um, Psalm chapter 22, I can number all my bones. Not one of them is broken. Guess what? The other two on the cross, they had broken bones and he didn't. And then when the, the, the soldier comes and they hadn't broken his legs, he pierces him with the sword. And guess what? There's a prophecy that said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And those prophecies, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Go to the book of Job. Job chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 14. Job chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 14. And when you, when you begin to compare these things, it just becomes, to me, these are the kind of things, you know, when, when, if somebody would say to me, why do you believe the Bible is true? Why do you believe it's true as opposed to the Koran or you know, the Bhagavad Gita or any other, quote, holy book of the world? You know, these kind of things in the scripture, and you don't, you don't see these kind of things in the scripture, and I understand that most people in the world out there, they don't, you don't see these things in the scripture because you've got to spend time studying the scripture to see these things, understand these things. But if you don't believe the scripture is the word of God, why are you going to spend time studying it? So it's kind of you know, a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I don't believe the book, I don't study the book. But if I don't study the book, I can't see all these things. So I'm never going to believe the book. So it, you know, it's hard to know where to start with someone. And I understand that. But you read this passage in Job, for example, chapter 9, verse 6. This passage is about God. Um, Job chapter 9 and verse 1, Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? And that's, that's a, you know, the, there's an interesting thing, it's not what we're talking about this morning. Job, first book written in the Bible probably, thousands of years ago, how can a man be just with God? And you know how long you wait to get a final answer to that? You wait till Paul to get an answer to that. How can a man be just how can a man be just with God? Job also asks, how can how can one born of an unclean person be clean? And it's all the way to Paul, you know, when he says, um, for he was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So how can a man be just? Being justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Paul answers those questions. Job asks them. So if you're looking for how, how do I know? Well, there's a question that Job asked thousands of years ago and then Paul comes along and in Romans chapter 3 you know, how can a man be just? Being justified freely by his grace. Wow! There's the answer to that question that Job asked. But that's, that's not the question we're looking at this morning. We're going to go on down. Verse... Uh, Three, uh, if he will, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him, and hath and who hath hardened himself against him, and hath prospered? Which removeth the mountains, and they know not. Which overturneth them in his anger. So he's, he's talking about all these things that are, are God. So the first question is, how can a man be just with God when God is all these things? God uh, is wise in heart. He He's mighty in his strength. Verse 5, he removeth the mountains, he overturneth them in his anger. Verse 6, he shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. Verse 7, uh, which he commanded the sun, and it riseth not, and he sealeth up the stars. Verse 8, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh... Uh, uh, Arcturus, Orion, and Pallades, and the chambers of the south. And that's talking about constellations in the heavens. But verse 8, He spreadeth out the heavens, this is creation, and he treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Jehovah God spreads out the heavens and treads upon the waves of the sea. You go to Matthew chapter 14, 
and verse 25. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on what? The sea. Matthew 14. So, so in Job, so hundreds, a couple thousand years before, Job says, Jehovah God treadeth upon the waves of the sea. And Jesus Christ comes along and walks on the waves of the sea. Now, if a man wrote this book, do you think man could write a book, write one book, you know, a couple thousand years before, and then come along a couple thousand years later and write another book and put a detail in there like that? That, well, remember, remember that guy wrote that book a couple thousand years ago, and it talked about God walking on the waves of the sea. So I think what we should do is put a little line in here and pretend like Christ walked on the waves of the sea too. And then that'll make him seem like God. And when you begin to look at all those connections and all those tiny little things that, man, this fits and this fits and this fits and this fits, it becomes very evident that it is the Word of God and it is true. And that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In fact, if you go to uh, Acts chapter 2, I didn't should have mentioned this one earlier, but it's one I want to mention. So, Acts chapter 2. And Peter says something in Acts chapter 2, and, and he gives Christ a title. Acts chapter 2, verse number 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom have crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's the first time in the Bible that those two titles are linked together to Christ. He's Lord and Christ. Acts chapter, I think it's 10 or 11, is the first time the, the title, Lord Jesus Christ, is used. When you get to Paul's epistles, it's all over the place, Lord Jesus Christ. And something that, that irritates me, and you know, it, you know, you hear things and it kind of makes the hair in the back of your neck stand up. You think, ooh, 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 I don't like that, like my singing this morning. Like, ooh. Um, you hear that. One of the things, it, I'll be at a Bible study or whatever, hearing somebody teach, and they're talking about Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's, that, that's what they always talk about is Jesus. Jesus did this, he did that, and that. But you know what? Jesus is the name of rejection. God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified. Jesus is his name of humiliation and suffering. But he's made that Jesus Lord both Lord and Christ. And Jesus is used during the earthly ministry, and it's used in a verse like that. Very rarely, if you read Paul's epistles, if ever, does he just call him Jesus. He calls him the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls him Christ Jesus. He calls him Jesus Christ. He calls him the Lord Jesus. He uses all those different combinations, but very rarely just Jesus. Because that's not I said earlier that name, Jesus of Nazareth. It's, it's a name of derision. It's his earthly name. It's, 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 um, it's how Israel viewed him. But he is not. God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You took him by wicked hands, you crucified and slain, uh, you have crucified and slain him, but God hath raised him up, and he is now not just Jesus. He's made that Jesus, that one of humiliation that you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So it's it's a title that he has, and we ought to honor that title and not not talk so much about Jesus as as talking about he is our Lord. And he is the Christ. And he is our Savior. And he's all those other things. But Paul, if you read, just, just read Paul's epistles and just look for the times that he refers to Christ. Flip um, 1 Corinthians. There's several places you can do this. But 1 Corinthians, he just he uses all these different combinations and terms for Christ. But rarely just Christ. In verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them which are sanctified in Christ Jesus. 
called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, uh, that in everything you are enriched by him in utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you, so that you are left behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm unto to you uh, all uh, the, uh, sh who shall confirm unto you uh, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You get the point. <laughs> when Paul talks about G our Lord Jesus Christ, he calls him that. Now, and, and you know, that's just one little ten verse segment there, but if you read through Paul's epistles, that's the way he refers to him. So we ought to refer to him that way and think of him that way. And he's not just Jesus of Nazareth, the name of humiliation. God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And God says, thy throne, O God, is forever. Now next week we're going to get into that faith. So but it's very important to understand when he says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Well, who is Christ Jesus? And, and, and what is the significance of him coming into the world to save sinners? And if you don't really have a good grasp on who Christ is, on who the Lord Jesus Christ is, then his coming into the world to save sinners and, and his death for us, I mean, it might be a nice thing, but it's not, it's not that big a deal unless you really have a good hold on who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the thing that makes Christianity, true Christianity, radically different from every religion of the world. Because it's the only belief system, it's the only paradigm that says the Creator gave Himself to redeem the creation. It's the only system that says that. And so understanding that Christ Jesus came into the world, having an understanding going into that. And, and I think that's why Paul reminds us in that passage, oh, oh, by the way, here's who Christ is. He's the king, the only wise God, immortal, eternal, immortal, invisible. He reminds us of that because that gives all that much more weight to he came into the world to save sinners. And we'll look at that in more detail next week. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Our God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ and the opportunity of looking at your word and studying it together this morning. And as we've done so, we pray that the things said and done have brought honor and glory to the name of Christ and been edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's all.